of Moses. That video was uh, produced for us in the graphic work by uh, a lady that is at one of our partner churches in Venezuela. And so she's really talented. I'm really thankful for her and her gifts. And we get to, to contribute to her. And uh, I don't know, just a blessing all the way around. So it's a really great video. I could never do that. So anyway, uh, welcome to Cross Community Church. Today we're beginning a new series called Jesus Is, where you guessed it, we're going to do our best to tell you who Jesus is, but we're going to do that through the characters and in the context of the Old Testament. And so today we're going to be looking at the Old Testament character Abraham. Um, now, if, if you're like me and you were raised in Sunday school or went to vacation Bible school, you know that uh, we have a father, Abraham. He had many sons. Many sons had father Abraham. You may be familiar uh, with him. But listen, I need to tell you that Abraham is a huge deal. Like, he's an extraordinary figure in the Bible. Like, God used him to really bring about all of the rest of what was going to happen. I mean, it, he, was, he was used profoundly by God in the Old Testament. Now, Abraham isn't just significant, though, to Christianity. Uh, if you've paid much attention to what's going on uh, in the region of Israel and the, the war that's happening over there, um, one of the reasons for that war points right back to who we're going to study today, and that is Abraham. As a matter of fact, it's not just Christianity in the Bible that would look back to Abraham, trace their roots back. Uh, Judaism also, they trace their roots back to Abraham, as well as Islam. And so the Muslims look back, and they would maybe sing a similar song like Father Abraham, right? They look back, trace their lineage back to Abraham, and you're going to see today maybe some of the reason for the conflict that's happening over there. And so um, maybe it'll give a little bit of perspective to how you can pray uh, for peace and for the people of that region. So matter of fact, by the way, I didn't share this with the first service. The Quran actually talks about Abraham, and it describes him as a model or an exemplar, as a man who is obedient and not an idolater. And so, again, Abraham, huge figure, um, again, not just central in Christianity, but also in Judaism as well as Islam. So, Abraham was an amazing figure with an extraordinary life used in a profound way by God in the Old Testament. Now, we're not going to be able to cover every aspect of Abraham's life. We're going to span several chapters. Chapters today. If you were ever a kid and did Bible drill, today is going to be your day because we get to do some flipping. We'll see how good you are. But we're going to begin in Genesis chapter 12 today. So if you have your device or your, your Bible that'll be on the screens as well, go ahead and turn with us to Genesis chapter 12. And we're going to look at three parts of Abraham's life. The first is his calling. The second is the covenant that God made with Abraham. And the third is the sacrifice that Abraham offered. So we're going to begin looking first at Abraham's calling. So just to set the context a little bit, um, you know the story of the flood. Um, God wiped out the world with a flood, saved a few on the ark, which was Noah and his sons. And uh, it, it wasn't a do-over per se, but in a sense, um, there was a new people. And, and we, Abraham comes on the scene not long after the flood. And we pick up in Genesis chapter 12. And the Lord says this in verse 1, The Lord said to Abram, by the way, I'm going to call him Abraham the whole time. His name changes, and that's confusing to all of us. Uh, but ultimately now his name is Abraham, and that's what we're going to call him, okay? So the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. This is Abraham's calling. He's living in his native land, as far as we know. This was where he was raised. This would have been what's comfortable and what is familiar to him. And God says, I want you to leave there and go to the place that I'm going to show you. Abraham doesn't know where that is at this point. He's just going to blindly obey God, go wherever God would call him to go. This is a difficult thing. I don't know about you, but it would take some convincing with my wife and kids to be like, hey, we're moving, not sure where yet, but we're just going to take off. And it wasn't limited to Abraham. It was also his relatives. In verse 2, it says, <clears throat> I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who did bless you and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abraham went as the Lord told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. He took his wife 
Sarah and Lot, his brother's son, and all of their possessions they had, they had gathered and the people that they had acquired in Haran, and they set out to go to the land of Canaan. They now know our destination is the land of Canaan. I believe I have a map here for you just to see kind of the, the journey that Abram and, or Abraham and his family would have taken from um, Ur of the Chaldeans um, around the peninsula there a bit, and then ultimately into the region of Canaan. So I give you this because I want to give some perspective on what's going on in this region today. I'm going to continue to read in verse 8. Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the oak of Moreh. At the time, the Canaanites were in the land. And then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. And so he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. And from there he moved to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent, and with Bethel on the west and I on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on still going toward the Negev. So this is a rather extraordinary calling. Hey, leave where where you live, leave the place where you're comfortable that you call home, and I want you to go to this place that I'm going to call you to go to. Now, I don't know about you, but in ordinary moments of my life, um, God often calls me to do things that I don't understand. Uh, Maybe it's something I've read in the scriptures, and I'm like, really? Is that that important? You know, it's like when you're a kid and you think it's just a little white lie and no one's going to notice. And then, you know, you have to tell another lie and suddenly things snowball and you're like, oh yeah, God knew what he was talking about. Um, The same thing happens to us as adults. We're like, God, um, is obedience really all that important? Is it really that big of a deal? I'm sure for Abraham, he was like, man, is it? I'd really just have to move, pack up everything, look like the Clampets traveling across the, the countryside, all our possessions, caravanning, wherever we're going to go. Is it that important? But listen, Abraham could have never understood the significance of what seemed like a fairly small act of obedience. Just an aside for us, and you may never understand the ramifications or the significance of a seemingly small act of obedience in your life, But God takes the little things that we offer to him, our little acts of obedience, and man, he uses them for his glory. You're going to see this in the life of Abraham because he didn't just have a profound calling. God was also going to establish a covenant with Abraham. So if you want to, go ahead and jump in your Bibles. We're going to be in Genesis. Uh, we're going to read. We already read 4th and 9th. Sorry. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 17 now. So just a couple of pages on where you are. Abraham has followed the Lord. He's gone into this new land and God is going to establish his covenant. Now, just to be really clear, this covenant is described from Genesis 12 all the way through chapter 17, but we kind of see it encompassed here in chapter 17. We're going to begin reading in verse 1. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful and I will make you into nations and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings and all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. What an extraordinary covenant! God is going to make with Abraham. It was God's sovereign choice to use this man, calling him out of his hometown to the land of Canaan and promising to bless him and make him a great nation and that that land would belong to him and his descendants forever. Now, I've got another map here of the Middle East. You'll see Canaan. You saw Canaan before, uh, but there's another map here that I have This is Israel. This is Gaza. This is the West Bank. This is the region. And if you want to know why some of the conflict is happening there, when you have the Jews 
and Muslims and even some Christians who trace their lineage back to Abraham would say, I'm a descendant of Abraham. That land rightly belongs to me. You understand the roots of some of the conflict there. But God made this covenant with Abraham. I'm going to make you into a great nation. Multitudes will come from you. Kings will come from your lineage. This is an everlasting covenant. I'm going to be your God. And you are going to be my people. Both you and your descendants as an everlasting covenant. This is going to go on and on and on and on. But there was just one problem with this covenant. Abraham didn't have any descendants. And Abraham was old. At this point, he's about 100 years old. His wife, Sarah, was 90. Uh, a few years ago, my wife, is a, well, she was working in labor and delivery at one of our local hospitals, and she came home kind of dejected one day. And I'm like, what's going on? She's like, oh, nothing. Anyway, I had to dig into it a little bit. Like, what is it? She said, you know, we had a lady come in today, and she's pregnant. You know, she's going to be delivering in our hospital, I assume. And She's like, I had to handle her paperwork, and I noticed that she, they, they noted that she was of advanced maternal age. She was an old lady to be having a baby at this point. And I was like, oh, really? How old was she? And Brittany's like, well, she's younger than us, if that tells you anything. It was a little hurtful for her to hear that she was of advanced maternal age. Uh, we were uh, under 40 at that point, I think, but getting close. And listen, if 40 years old is advanced maternal age, Sarah was like elite maternal age, right? There's no way that this is going to happen. Abraham and Sarah, even then, they knew, like, you don't have kids when you're, you're 90 and he's 100, right? That, that doesn't happen. They, they saw this as an impossibility. And so they did what we often do. They took matters into their own hands. God wants to make us into a great nation. I guess we got to help him, right? God helps those who help themselves. And so they came up with this plan where Sarah says, I'm going to give to you my maidservant. And you can have her as your wife, and you all can have a kid. And certainly, um, that's, that's what happened. Abraham marries uh, Sarah's maidservant, and they have a son together named Ishmael. But as you can imagine, if you got sister wives in the home, um, things didn't go, there, go well there for Sarah at all. As a matter of fact, she hated Hagar and just wanted her gone. And so she gives with Abraham, like, you need to send her away. And they, they did. It's kind of a tragic story he sends his wife and son out into the, the wilderness. And by the way, there is a beautiful, if you want to know more about God and, and how he feels about you in the difficult and the dark times of your life, the most difficult moments, um, there is this really tender moment where um, she's crying out to God on behalf of her and her son. And God sees her and he hears her and he responds to her. As a matter of fact, the name Ishmael actually means God hears and so I don't, I don't have time to preach on that today, uh, but just beautiful what God did there. But listen, God was still faithful to his covenant. Even though uh, Abraham and Sarah did their own thing, like had a kid with her uh, maidservant, and that was obviously not the correct route, um, God did the miraculous. He opened up Sarah's womb. She became pregnant, and she bore a son named Isaac, uh, which is about the most... Um, the name you would expect from someone that has a kid when they're 90, it actually means I laugh or laughter in Hebrew. It's like, oh my goodness, that's all we can do. And we're 90 and 100 and we're having a kid. We're going we're gonna to laugh about this. So God gives to them their error. And if you've read much of the scripture, you'll know that over and over and over throughout the Bible, uh, you're going to see the Jews referencing back to their father, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, this lineage where God really did what he promised to do for Abraham. He made him into a great nation. Kings and, and rulers and descendants, and they were God's people, and he was their God. He was going to deliver them from captivity in Egypt and lead them across the Red Sea and through the wilderness to the promised land, which was the land of Canaan, right? He was going to lead them. He's going to give them. They're going to take possession of this land that God had for them. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God had an extraordinary calling for Abraham. And he made this extraordinary covenant with Abraham. 
But then the third act, if you will, of Abraham's life that I want us to focus in on today is the sacrifice that Abraham offered. Now, if you longed to have children, and you couldn't, and you didn't, and then when you're 90 and 100 years old, you have a son, you're going to love that son. It's a big deal. And yet, if you jump over to Genesis chapter 22 in verse 1, God speaks to Abraham, and he tells him, he says, uh, Hey, I'm going to, and we didn't tell him he's going to test him. God is testing Abraham, and he says, I want you to take your son Isaac. I want you to go to the region of Moriah up on one of the mountains. I want you to build an altar there. I want you to arrange the wood on the altar, and then I want you to bind up your son and place him on the altar and offer him as a burnt offering to me. So Abraham, he takes his son Isaac. They travel to the region. They go up on the mountain. And in verse 9 of Genesis 22, we see that when they came to the place which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order. And he bound Isaac, his son, and he laid them on the altar on top of the wood. And then Abraham reached out his hand and he took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. Abraham called the name of that place the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. And so, Abraham's life. And you were the guy I called out of your hometown, out of the, the, the place that was comfortable and known to you, to this land of Canaan. And there in Canaan, God made a covenant that was going to turn you into a great nation. Multitudes of people were going to come from you, kings and rulers. And he was going to give you this land and it would be belong to you and your descendants for, forever. It's an everlasting covenant God made with them. And then this profound test where Abraham offered his son Isaac there on the altar. But rather than having to go through with it, God provided the sacrifice instead, the ram that was caught in the bushes. Now you can see quite an extraordinary life here in the person of Abraham. He was the one that God called, that God made a covenant with. He was the one who offered an extraordinary sacrifice to God. And oftentimes it's at this point in the sermon where preachers want to tell you to go be like Abraham. Go be obedient like Abraham. Go follow the example of Abraham. Today I'm not going to do that. Because if you look at the life of Abraham, there were some pretty glaring imperfections there as well. And as great as Abraham may have ultimately been, God, in fulfillment of the covenant that he made with Abraham, through his lineage, was going to send one who was greater than Abraham. Then we will, when we look back and we trace back and say, who is the one that we worship and revere and adore? It's not Abraham. It's the one who came after him. The one who was ultimately greater. It was Jesus. You see, the Bible is not a collection of 66 different books. It's one story of God's redemptive work throughout history. It is his story. The Bible is God revealing his unchanging nature and character to the world. He did work through individuals like Abraham, like David, like Isaac, like all of the characters that we see in the scripture. But it was really God's story of redemption that he's been working all along. What God did through Abraham was call a people unto himself and say, Hey, I'm going to be your God and you're going to be my people. But it was just a step in his redemptive work throughout history. Abraham's calling, the covenant that God made with him, the sacrifice that he offered, were really just pointing to one who would ultimately come, who had a greater calling, 
who would offer a greater sacrifice and institute a greater covenant. Our hope isn't to be like Abraham. Instead, our hope is that we would be conformed to the image of Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the King who would come through the lineage of Abraham. So today I want to spend the rest of our time talking to you about who Jesus is and talking about how Jesus had a greater calling and offered a greater sacrifice and instituted a greater covenant than Abraham. If you remember, Abraham was called to leave the comfort and the familiarity of the land in which he lived. And yet, Jesus had a greater calling. He left the comfort and the glory of heaven. And he came to earth. And he took on flesh. He made his dwelling among us. And Jesus came to earth not to be served, but to be a servant. And he was a servant who was obedient even unto death. Jesus left a greater place, heaven, to serve a greater purpose, which was the redemption of the world. It culminated in the cross where Jesus Christ, the perfect man, Jesus, who lived a sinless life, he went to the cross there and he suffered and he bled and he died for us. It was a greater calling than Abraham's. Listen, we don't pray to Abraham. We don't hope in Abraham. But we hope in the one who had a greater calling than him. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who there on the cross, he suffered and he bled and he died for us. Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. They tell us that God bestowed on him Jesus. Remember he said he was going to make Abraham's name great that kings would come through Abraham. Philippians 2, 9 through 11 says, God bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue would confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus left the comfort of heaven to joyfully take on the agony of the cross, and he did it so that we might know true and abundant, and eternal life. You see, our belonging to Jesus isn't the same as our belonging or the Jews belonging to Abraham. Uh, the Jews look back and they say, well, that's our blood. That's, that, that is our lineage. We, we belong to Abraham because we are ethnically Jewish. That's who we are. We are God's people uh, because of our bloodline. And yet, we know that God didn't stop with the Jews, but he also wanted to include, he wanted to make a great people for himself who would be a blessing to the whole world. And so Jesus Christ went to the cross and shed his blood so that Jews and Greeks and Gentiles like you and me could be called sons of God. Jesus had a greater calling. It was to save the world. But he also offered a better sacrifice. When God told Abraham to take his son, man, listen, I don't want to discount what Abraham did to take your one and only son and to place him there on the altar and to be prepared to sacrifice him. Extraordinary. But if you'll remember, on that day, God provided the sacrifice. So Abraham didn't actually have to go through with it. And God said something so interesting to him there in verse 12. He says, now I know that you fear me. Now I know, Abraham, that you truly love me because you didn't withhold your only son from me. And today, we can know that God truly loves us because he didn't withhold his only son from us. Jesus Christ went to the cross to die for you and for me. Men and women who sinned against him. Galatians 6.23 kind of tells a story. The wages of sin is death. What you and I deserve because of our sin is death. 
That's what we deserve. That's what our, our behaviors and our sins, the days you're ashamed of, the moments that you regret, that's what our sin earned us, death. And yet God sent his son, Jesus Christ, and offered him as a substitute and a sacrifice for us. Jesus died the death that we deserved. He offered himself. Jesus, the one man who lived a perfect, sinless life, went to the cross and offered himself there as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. God demonstrates his love for you. He knew your name and he knew your sin and he knew your circumstances. God demonstrates his love for you and that he didn't withhold his only son from you. And Jesus went to the cross joyfully because he knew he was coming, that we might experience true and abundant life, that we might be reconciled to our heavenly Father, to God who is in heaven. Jesus came with a greater calling, and he offered a better sacrifice. And the final thing is that he instituted a better covenant. The covenant that he made with Abraham will make you into a great nation, multitudes of people, and they're going to be vast, as many as the, the number of the sand on the seashore, kings and rulers. And I'm going to give you this land. It's going to be yours for generations and everlasting. And yet through Jesus Christ, he came as a king, fulfilling the covenant that God had made with Abraham. He was a ruler, the king of kings, and the Lord of lords came through his lineage, but Jesus came to institute a greater covenant, a covenant that would extend to Jews and Gentiles alike, a covenant that would cover us in our sins, a covenant that wasn't based on our behavior, how well we keep the rules, how well we live our lives, or how many good works we do, but a covenant in the blood of Jesus Christ alone, a covenant that is by faith. We don't receive it by works. We don't receive it through our best holy living because that wasn't good enough. We receive the new covenant in the blood of Jesus Christ by faith alone. The wage of our sin was death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. And we receive this covenant not through birth physically, but through be, being born again through faith in Jesus Christ. And the kingdom that God gives to us is not merely a temporary earthly region or land, but rather um, it is entrance. It is inheritance in God's eternal kingdom. It's not temporary. It lasts forever. And so in Jesus Christ, we have a greater calling he offered a greater sacrifice, and he instituted a better covenant for us. Today, you may find that as you think about the war going on in the Middle East and all the factors involved, you may in some ways feel very pulled into the very personal suffering that's happening. And, and if that's true of you, you should. I mean, we should um, weep with those who weep and mourn with those who mourn. We should pray for peace and that sin and evil would be restrained in this world. Um, that's the proper response of God's church. But we should also pray that those who have placed their hope in a man named Abraham, the fact that they trace their lineage back to him and think that they belong to God merely because of their blood, um, we should also pray that they come to recognize the greater Abraham, Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world who came with a greater calling and offered a greater sacrifice and instituted a greater covenant that they may be reconciled to God. That is our ultimate hope and our ultimate prayer. If you want to see peace in the world, it's when people are reconciled to God and their hearts are transformed and they're set free from the sin that rages within every one of us apart from Jesus Christ. In Romans chapter 9, verses 4 and 5, Paul talks about his brothers, his Jewish brethren, he says to them, he says, They are the Israelites. To them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. 
And from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. Man, the descendants of Abraham, the physical descendants of Abraham, extraordinary gifts through Abraham's calling, through his covenant, through his sacrifice. But for those of us who are now made sons and daughters of God, who have been adopted as sons and daughters of God through faith in Jesus Christ, we have something that is even greater. We have much to be thankful for. We should be people of hope and not people of fear, knowing that God is in control of our entire lives. Jesus came down from heaven and he took on flesh and he endured the suffering of the cross and he did it for us and he did it for them. And so as we pray, we pray that the nations may know Jesus just as we do. Today I have um, three practical applications for you as we think about how Jesus is a greater Abraham. We're reminded of who Jesus is. The first is this. Maybe for you, you're kind of like the Jews. And you're trusting in your lineage to make you right with God. You're like, you know, I was raised in church. My parents were Christians. My grandparents were Christians. You know, I've been around. Um, but the new covenant in Jesus Christ is a new covenant that's received by faith. It's one that we enter into individually. It's not based upon our lineage or works or any other thing, but it is based upon faith. And so I would ask you the question, have you come to place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? Have you been born again into a new and living hope? Have you been adopted as a son and daughter of God? Do you know Jesus Christ? And if you don't, I want to encourage you today to respond in faith to the gospel, the good news that Jesus died for you to die the death that you deserve, that you might be reconciled to God and live with him for eternity. Point number one, maybe you just need to receive Jesus Christ. Respond in faith to him today. I want to invite you to do that. Just trust in him right where you are. Confess your sins and ask Jesus to save you. The second thing I want to invite you to do is just to receive God's unending love for you. And I got to sit with some people this week, and this is just a perk of the job, if you will, and sat with some people who are suffering, who have endured some hard things, dark days, difficult moments. I don't know where you are, but I know that sometimes in the midst of really painful moments and perilous times even, we can question, does God really love us? I want to remind you again today that God loved you enough that he didn't withhold his only son. And in the midst of your circumstances, be reminded that he is a God who is faithful to his covenants. He is a God who loves you and was willing to die that you might find true and abundant and eternal life in him. And so in this season, just be reminded that God loves you and he is with you. And then the final thing is just to remember that God will never leave you nor forsake you. He's a God who is faithful to his covenants. I know oftentimes um, men and women, and particularly those of us who were raised in church and we ought to know better, right? That's me. Um, when we fall down, when we fall into sin, we fall off the wagon, if you will. When we blow it big time with our family or with our friends, uh, we can often wonder, how does God feel about me? And am I okay? Is God mad at me? Is he angry? And yet the cross reminds us that Jesus, he went and he suffered and he bled and he died. There he took all of our sins. He took our sin and he took our guilt and he took our shame and he endured our punishment. And there on the cross, Jesus cried out, It is finished. There on the cross, Jesus bore all of your sin and credited to you and to me his righteousness so that when God sees you, he doesn't see your mistakes. He doesn't see your sin. He doesn't see your failure. He doesn't see your past. He sees his beloved child. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was at a ball game with my oldest son, and sometimes I just want my kids to not get to play. 
You know what I mean? Because it's far less stressful as a parent because you're like, are they going to blow it? They're really going to do poorly. And then I've got to, you know, try to pat them on the back and, you know, tell them to keep on going. But this game in particular, and it was one of the good ones. And so my son, like late in the game, he caught an interception. He returned it for a touchdown. And thankfully, my dad was videoing the whole thing. And I'm like, I can't wait to see the video because, you know, I'm proud of my boy, you know. He's better than I ever was at sports. And so I'm watching this video and I'm just celebrating my son. And then I realized that my dad didn't just capture my son and his return. He also captured my son's crazy father yelling and, and getting completely undignified as he catches the ball. And then I'm, I'm yelling like, go, you know, and he's running and he's, you know, crossing the 50-yard line and then the 40. And I'm going on and on and on, completely undignified parent cheering my son on from the stands. It's humiliating to listen to, by the way. But listen, you need to know that that's how God feels about you. That sometimes, yes, you fall down and you make mistakes, but he's already bore your sin. And what he sees in you as a child that he dearly loves and he wants to see you walk in the fullness and the abundance of life that he has for you. And so, yes, you're going to stumble sometimes, and yet he's going to encourage you to get back up and to keep on running. Listen, all of heaven rejoices when sinners repent. And I believe that's true of people who come to faith in Jesus Christ. And I believe that's true for you and for me when we blow it and we fall down and then we get back up and we keep running again. So maybe you're here today and you've blown it in ways that you swore that you never would. Just know that your heavenly father is rooting you on and he wants to see you live a victorious and abundant Christian life where you live a a life that honors him and is of the fullest and highest joy to you. So once again today, Maybe you need to receive Jesus as Lord. Maybe you need to be reminded of his unending love for you. And maybe you need to remember that he'll never leave you nor forsake you. Jesus is a far greater Abraham. Our hope and our trust is in him. Would you bow with me? Father, we do thank you for your word. We're thankful, God, that you're a God who's faithful to your covenants, that you don't leave us or forsake us. God, we're thankful that you love so much differently than love we often see exhibited in this world, that you love with a perfect and divine love that that isn't contingent upon how we respond to you, but it's just rooted in your character that you are a God of love, and so you pour out your unending love on us to those who belong to you, to your children. Lord, I pray that we would respond in appropriate worship to you and that we would live lives that honor and glorify you. For the person here that doesn't know you, I pray that today would be the day of salvation. For the person who's been struggling and feeling alone, God, would you just remind them of your love for them? For the person who's been down and ready to give up because they keep struggling in their sin, would you just remind them that you will never leave them nor forsake them? We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.